obviously overwhelmingly female group. Uh, that's just a fun stereotype I, I pick on, but there's a lot of stereotypes that that busts. And it's nice to see, um, you know, a three-digit number of people involved in this in this charitable uh, outreach, which is kind of unusual, never mind the Free Stater thing. It's, it's a great thing to do. Um, so uh, just to wrap up real quick here, because we want to take Q&A, just a couple of other things um, in terms of activism. One of, the, one of the more visible things that we see is uh, things like protests and civil disobedience. Um, it's, it's maybe not the majority. Um, I think it's a minority that do that, but, but it's sometimes a little more visible. And there's been protests or civil disobedience about a lot of different issues, professional licensing like taxis and manicures. There's a taxi thing going on right now. Um, parking meters, taxes, war, court decisions, politicians, police brutality, the list goes on and on and on about things that people have protested over the years. Uh, and also education, and I give this a half a slide, but it's a big deal for Jason. He spends a lot of time, and it's actually a big deal for me. Um, Edie and I homeschool our, chil our four children. And, um, and then there's t tutoring, teachers, schools, all kinds of things that free staters do along those lines. And education, scholarships, that could go here or in the uh, charity column, if you will, but New Hampshire has a, a great education scholarship program that the legislature has adopted that allows uh, businesses to donate to a charity that will award scholarships for primary school and, and get a tax credit for that, which is kind of nice. It's not quite a uh, Friedman-esque voucher program. In some respects, I think it's better, but uh, helps promote competition and freedom in education. Also, there's a little brouhaha going in Croydon right now. It's made the front page of the Union Leader a time or two over whether the school board there can um, send kids to private schools. So those are, those are ways that uh, free staters are promoting education and educational freedom. So, um, you know, there's a lot more that I could say. I won't because it's impossible to get to it all. Uh, so at this point, we'd like to open it up to Q&A. And before we start with uh, questions, just a couple of reminders. There's videoing in progress. Um, we have Cheshire TV here, and also I see a couple of others. Um, and so there's a note about that in your, in your little handout. Um, challenging questions are welcome. In fact, I like challenging questions. Not everybody does, so feel free to ask the hard questions. And uh, if, if Jason doesn't like them, I'll, I'll take them. And uh, try to be a little bit brief because of the, <laughs> because of the um, video there. What I think I'll do is repeat the question just so that we have the audio all set up and, uh, and it's, it's able to be heard on Cheshire TV. And because this event is primarily, or was intended anyways, primarily to be kind of for the public, um, I'd like to ask if, if the uh, non-free staters, do, is there any, I don't know if this is a polite thing to do, but it, if you're a free stater, if you want to at least out yourself here, most, a lot of the room, okay. And people who aren't free staters, well, okay, we got a few, good, excellent. Um, so I, I'd kind of like to prioritize non-free staters because we're here for you to answer questions that may stem from misconceptions or, or whatever. And uh, if you have them, please go ahead and bring them. And if you want to raise your hand, maybe we'll point. And uh, okay, Mark. What's the purpose of this uh, event? You're 11 years on here now, and um, you decided it's, uh, this. I think this first time you've had an event like this. What's the purpose? This is the second one, actually. Jason, okay. go ahead. You, you should answer this. Yeah. Question. So um, the Free State Project had never really done anything in New Hampshire. The Free State Project as an organization, other than the the two events that, that Baron talked about. And so one of the things I thought about when, when I moved here was, well, why don't we change this? Why don't we actually start to sign up people as friends here in New Hampshire? Let's, uh, let's show what we're all about because um, you know, it comes up in the news, it comes up on social media, and people want to know. So let's, let's go around the state, let's, um, let's do these sort of town hall meetings and let people ask questions. What is the Free State Project? What are you Free Staters all about? You know, what's going on? And so I did one in West Lebanon where I live, and then this is the second one, and we're going to be doing these around the state uh, over the next couple of years. I've got a question for Jason. You talked uh, at the beginning about the how and the why of the Free State Project, and you know, like why move, but can you talk a little bit more about how you came up with the idea for the Free State Project? 
Well, it was a combination of uh, being a little bit frustrated with the political situation after the 2000 election, and, um, and also some of the work I was doing while I was writing my dissertation. Uh, my dissertation was not on the Free State Project. It was on um, uh, parties in Western Europe and North America, political parties that want independence for their country. So one example is in Catalonia on tomorrow, there's a, a ele big election with a, um, a couple of political parties that want to break away from Spain and form an independent country. So I was studying these parties and um, what caused people to vote for those parties, what effect did they have on the political system. One of the things I found with their effect on the political system is that uh, regions that have parties like that tend to get more autonomy over time. Central governments compromise with them and say, hey, here are some autonomous powers for you. Now you can control education or you can control taxation or something. We saw this uh, actually with Scotland recently. And Scotland had a referendum on independence and Britain said to them, um, wait, don't declare independence, we'll give you more powers. And so what occurred to me was, you know what, uh, the US has become more and more centralized over time, more and more power in the federal government, less in, in towns and states. But maybe we're going to turn around. The rest of the world has. Britain, Spain, Belgium, Italy, all these countries have become more decentralized over time. Maybe this will come to the US and maybe we need a movement that's going to push for more autonomy alongside the, the traditional concerns that classical liberals and libertarians have. Um, so that kind of idea of focusing on a state really came out of that. If possible, I'd love to ask a follow-up. Uh, since you mentioned about political parties, did you study the ballot access uh, where a lot of European countries have much more fair ballot access than here in the U.S. where different political parties are treated differently? It, was that in your study at all? Yeah, so the electoral system in a lot of European countries is more proportional, which means that political parties can get a uh, seats in proportion to the number of votes that they get. And so that allows smaller parties to get elected. And I found that does influence support for these parties that want independence. Um, and it influences support for all sorts of alternative parties. Now, some people say, well, why don't you, libertarians and free staters and all that, why don't you run on the libertarian party label? Why are you running as Republicans and Democrats? Well, I mean, first of all, libertarians have been a part of the Republican and Democratic parties since those parties were formed, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, going back to the 19th century, Grover Cleveland was uh, as close to a libertarian as a president we've ever had. He was a Democrat. Um, a lot of the, uh, the abolitionist movement uh, was libertarian. Um, right? Frederick Douglass was a libertarian, basically, if we're going to put a modern term on his philosophy. So both Republicans and Democrats have had a libertarian strain forever. Um, but in addition to that, our electoral system doesn't allow third parties a chance. Right? Uh, it's first past the post, whoever gets the most votes wins, so no one votes for third parties. I mean, if, if the Republicans and Democrats want to change that system, hey, that, that'd be great. I'd like more choices on the ballot. Um, but they haven't done that, so of course libertarians are going to run as Republicans and Democrats. Mark? I'd like to hear the science behind the 20,000 number. I'll, re I'll repeat the question. The science behind the 20,000 number. Jason, this one's for you. Uh, so actually, there was no science behind it originally. <laughs> I, I, I proposed that number in the original essay because I thought it was a number we could reach, uh, maybe. Um, but uh, there was no science behind it originally. And then after that, I tried to do some research. Well, you know, what what is the threshold of activists for a movement or a party that results in majority support? Right? How much of, of a percentage of the population has to be activist for you to get that majority support? And it looked as if uh, if you had 20,000 real activists in a movement in a state with population less than 2 million, that, that was, there was sort of a, maybe one, if 1% 1 of the population, uh, more or less, is, is uh, actually donating and donating their time and, and involved in a movement that that would correspond to getting majority support in the population. Um, but um, but it's it's only a rough guess. So we don't we don't really know um, how 20,000 uh, free staters in New Hampshire will, will affect um, all the things that the Varen talked about free staters being involved in. 
Go ahead. You, you talked about the, the Constitution of the state of New Hampshire talking about a sovereign state and relegating a limited number of powers to uh, federal government, uh, but that's not the world we live in today. The U.S. Constitution has been, you know, they drive, drive a truck through the Commerce Clause, the General Welfare Clause, and the Necessary and Proper Clause, and give the federal government powers to do anything and say anything and compel it. How as a free state project are you, you hope to change that? Because if you don't change that, the amount of freedom that can be had in like the state of New Hampshire is limited by the amount of freedom taken by the federal government. So just to summarize the question uh, on the microphone here, there's a conflict between the New Hampshire Constitution as written and the status quo today where the federal government takes more power than the New Hampshire government, uh, New Hampshire Constitution appears to allow, and in fact, even the U.S. Constitution appears to allow. So how would the, the Free State Project, or maybe if I could suggest Free Staters, is that a fair amendment? Fair. Um, how, would, how would we address that question? I don't know, do you want to answer that? or? or do you uh, I have to? some thoughts on that, uh, and if you have thoughts, by all means, jump in. Uh, I think we just have to start somewhere, and I agree with you that um, that since the, especially since the the court cases between 1937 and 1942, the switch in time that saved nine, right? And the Supreme Court suddenly says, "Hey, federal government, do whatever you want uh, now." Commerce clause means anything that might be related to commerce sometime can be regulated in any way you want, uh, unless it's explicitly prohibited in the Bill of Rights. Uh, I think that was uh, you know a devastating loss. For, for liberty and for uh, local autonomy. Um, but uh, it's reversible in the long run. Now, we're, we're, I think we need um, a political movement that is dedicated to, to local autonomy. We don't really have that. People are fair weather federalists, right? So a lot of conservatives will say, oh, I'm all for you know, states' rights or federalism. Uh, but then when it comes to um, you know, letting states legalize marijuana, or, <laughs> or you know, maybe even other drugs. Um, now that that cannot be permitted. The federal government ha we have to have a nationwide standard there. Never mind the fact that under the original understanding of the Constitution, the federal government couldn't just ban substances. Right? That's why there had to be a constitutional amendment to ban alcohol. There's no constitutional amendment to ban all this other stuff. So, uh, so we need a political movement that, that's really going to press for this. Until we get that, uh, Congress and the Supreme Court are not going to go out of their way to, to start reimposing these constitutional limits on, on the federal government. Um, and uh, there's a little bit of a, of a start to that, right? So there's a little bit of a new federalism jurisprudence in the Supreme Court where they have struck down some things and said, well, actually, this doesn't have a relationship to commerce, right? So we're starting to see just an inkling of returning to that decentralized system. And so I think we just need to kind of push on that. And over time, this might be an open door, right, where both liberals and conservatives and libertarians can all agree, hey, let's let states, let's let New York do its progressive thing, let's let California do its progressive thing, New Hampshire do its libertarian thing, Mississippi do its conservative thing, uh, and we'll all be better off because we'll all live in polities that are much more to our liking. Um, so I, I think we can get there, but it's going to take lots of effort and lots of commitment to the long run. I, I tend to agree with that, and, and just to uh, maybe give two contrasting concepts. One is the concept of law. So any any nation or any jurisdiction, whether it be a nation or a state or a town or whatever, um, would have some kind of government, and it has writing things and operational things and so on and so forth. And then there are people, po the populace, and they have ideas about the way things ought to be. Typically, the go there's a relationship between the government and the people in that um, the government is some sort of distorted reflection of the people or vice versa if you want to look at it that way. Sometimes the government, um, those who work in the government or pass the laws or whatever sort of lead the populace in a particular direction and sometimes the populace sort of leads the government in a particular direction. But they tend not to be radically, wildly divorced from each other. When they are for long periods of time then you typically have revolutions. So. Um, you know, one angle with, from which we could look at this is if New Hampshire becomes substantially more liberty friendly and the federal government is the major, major problem, eventually this could come to some kind of breaking point where uh, a negotiation um, with, 
with teeth, let's say. Some kind of meaningful negotiation could occur if the state says, even if New Hampshire was by itself, if the state says, no, this is the deal, we're going we're to use every legal power that we have to oppose this, and our people disagree, and in fact, if the federal government imposes it, we're just not even going to comply. Um, that would send a strong message. If many states do that, there's already evidence that that can be successful. And I'll give an example from within the last decade. This came up again within the last week or so, and that is Real ID. The federal government, um, maybe 10 years ago, passed a law that was intended to create effectively a national ID card out of state driver's licenses. So it would provide a uniform database and standard specifications for driver's licenses. Um, it was not technically a national ID. But de facto, it was a national ID. And uh, New Hampshire led the way at, at turning that down. And in fact, the law now says that New Hampshire is barred from participating in such a thing. Um, New Hampshire wasn't the first state to have that passed into law, but it was the first legislative body to pass such a bill. Other states then, that same year, or maybe early the next year, passed bills. And now there's, I don't know, 20 or so, 10 or 15 or 20 states that have opted out of real ID. Well, that effectively kills it. And, and it's coming back now because the federal government is saying, well, you can't fly as of next year if you don't have a real ID compliant driver's license. And ultimately, this will, this will come down to a conflict between the federal government and the states, but more importantly, the people. If the people go to their states and say, well, we really want to fly, so we better uh, give this back up and let you do the national ID thing. Then it may succeed if only one state says no. But if the people in 10 or 15, New York, by the way, is one of those states, one of the most populous states in the country. If the people in 10 or 15 states say no, don't do it, we're not going to comply, the federal government will practically be powerless when millions of people then can't go flying. And that will effectively end real ID. And there are other uh, potential applications of that kind of concept. So the